Very happy to be here. Just yesterday, in fact, we had the uh, press conference of the Raksha Mantri. And I presume that all your questions have been answered. But if there's still any gaps, then I'll try to fill them up. Uh, firstly, uh, thank you also for the support the IAF. And uh, what you see outside at the event year 2013 uh, is the reflection of some of our capabilities. But that's actually for the show part, where the industry and the Air Force meet together uh, to support the IF and whatever capability building plan is concerned. But the actual part of the operationalization of what is going to happen is perhaps we'll get an opportunity again when you visit Pokhran on the 22nd of February, where we'll actually be doing the exercise iron fist, which will translate all this capability into exactly what FX is going to produce on the ground. So I extend a very warm welcome to our media, friends media, to attend that function as well. So with this much, I'll show the uh, press conference open, and I'll try and answer your questions. I have all the time in the world, so let's not step on to each other. Take your time, and we go one by one. Thank you. Okay, now we'll start with the lady. Ms. Neela Matthews? Neela, you always get the first call. <laughs> Just thank you, sir. Very um, special. Thank you. Uh, this is regarding uh, the procurements. Uh, we spoke about it yesterday, sir. What is going to be your priority for the 2013-2014 budget? Because yesterday the minister said that you have to lay out your priorities because of the reduction in the defense budget. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, at least for 2013-14, uh, what we're going to have is that there are a number of projects which are almost on the final stages. Where I'm talking about the process itself is concerned. The, uh, and some of them which are actually coming close to conclusion are the uh, Special Ops 6 C-130 aircraft, uh, which are going to be based at Ponagar. Uh, that, those final discussions are going on. The next, of course, alongside is the uh, 22 attack helicopters, the Apache, for the IAF. We have 22, uh, I'm sorry, 15 uh, heavy lift helicopters. Again, for those cases, the rear refueling tanker, the MRTT, Airbus 330, that project itself. So these are some of the major cases, but of course, as we mentioned yesterday, the mother of all cases, the MMRCA. In my view, MMRCA takes the highest priority. Alongside, there are some other smaller, small projects uh, uh, which will go uh, to enhance our capabilities in that field. We also have to enhance our training capacity. The Pilates has come, but we have to now work on the additional aircraft that are required to fill in the uh, training slots for our cadets. That also assumes a very high uh, so priority in our scheme of things. And alongside, of course, there are some ongoing projects like the BrahMos, the air to surface uh, project that's going on, and some weapons uh, that we're looking at. So, overall, this is the kind of capability that we're looking at for the next 2030 2014. <coughs> and the government is fully aware of our requirements uh, and the, uh, fully conscious of our needs. I'm confident that we will do it. <coughs> Manish Shukla? मेरा सवाल है कि पिछले कई दिनों से देखा जा रहा है कि जो नक्सल्स हैं वो लगातार जो आपके हेलीकॉप्टर्स हैं जो डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन में लगे हुए हैं उस पर अटैक कर रहे हैं इंटरनेट पे तमाम रिपोर्ट्स आ रही हैं कि उन्होंने बड़े लेवल पर प्लानिंग की है कि कैसे आपको कैसे आपके हेलीकॉप्टर को अटैक करना है गिराना है तो क्या आपने कोई स्ट्रेटी आपकी तरफ से चेंज की जा रही है कि ऐसे जो ऑपरेशन हो रहे हैं नक्सल एरिया में आपके हेलीकॉप्टर को नुकसान भी ना हो जो पैरामिलिट्री फोर्स हैं उनकी जान का भी खतरा ना हो before, before we end the conference, then I can tell you in detail. Yes. We take this question later. Uh, Mr. Ajay Banerjee. One second. Sir, I have two simple <coughs> questions. One, sir, on day one when the area started on the 5th, you referred to having around 
three to four hundred eight crores, you reckon to that number. Could you give us a breakdown? What is in your mind about these three to four hundred eight crores which you spoke from the fifth of February? My second question is: So the Chinese recently carried out a trial run of its transport aircraft. The Chinese recently carried out a trial run of their transport aircraft. What is your report on it, and how does it change the dynamics of China with India? Yeah, what I spoke about was the the three to four hundred aircraft that I spoke about was actually now we're looking at for the next two plan periods up to 2022. That means the 12th plan and the 13th plan period. And as you're aware, that many of our existing platforms are being phased out. That includes for the fixed wing as well as for the road wing. And some of the uh, uh, transport aircraft as well. In fact, the airplane will also get phased out. So replacement of all these. But if you want a, a full breakdown, then that will perhaps require another meeting. Um, I, I could give that to you. That's not a problem. But you know, our mid 21s are being phased out. All of them, all of them will go out. The mid 27s will phase out, and the replacements are going to come. Uh, alongside, you have some of our helicopters. The old Mi 8s are being phased out. Then uh, Mi 17s, of course, are getting upgraded. Uh, the existing Mi 17s, about 95 of them. They are being upgraded for night vision and better avionics systems. And uh, on the transport side, the Avros, 56 Avros will get phased out. And the additional ones that are going to come are the, uh, in terms of numbers, will be the, uh, the light utility helicopters that will be there, the attack helicopters I just mentioned to you. So overall, that's the kind of figures we are looking at. The NCH, the light combat helicopter, the light utility helicopter, and also the one which HL is, is planning to make indigenously, the RSH, the reconnaissance and surveillance helicopter. So these are the, some of the additionalities that will take place in the next 10 to 12 years. As far as the second question is concerned about the Chinese, uh, I think it's a Y20, right? Yes. Y20, yes. It's a, it, it appears to be like a strategic airlift aircraft. Uh, and from the specs that I have seen, it is somewhat looking uh, in, in the class of the, uh, of perhaps the C-17, of a payload of about 70 tons. So that's that's what it appears to us in the first uh, look at the at the figures. And obviously, uh, the engines look the same ones that we have for the IL-76, the DPK-02. Right? Something similar. Not as good as the one that we on the C-17 at the moment. So it will have a strategic airlift uh, performance-wise, whether it will be able to perform to the roles that we have in mind for our strategic uh, airlift acquisition is something that we'll have to wait and watch to see how the development process of that aircraft continues. We take a question from uh, the gentleman in front. It's a third. Sir, so, Devesh Agarwal, Bangalore Aviation. Uh, trust in this year's Aero India has been to try and source more from India. And the Indian Air Force is one of the biggest end customers. What advice, what observation would you give to captains of industry that, as a customer in terms of where, uh, like kind of a quick SWOT analysis on Indian industry in meeting your needs over the next 20 years? Uh, did you attend that seminar the, that we had on the fifth morning? Was I'm there? sorry, I did not, sir. Sorry? No, I did not, sir. Ah, I wish you had. Because there I spelled it out for 20 minutes, uh, what we had to do uh, to make our indigenous industry, uh, aviation industry really come up. Uh, but to give you a very broad, uh, let's say, uh, analysis of what we believe should be the, the right approach, of course, we have a very big uh, workforce. We have a lot of engineers here. We need to harness their capabilities, a lot of mentoring and grooming is required. And the companies, both international and the local companies, need to harness that particular strength that we have in our people. Uh, that, that is a workforce to start with. We also have to get into partnerships. You cannot make aeroplanes straight away from which you've never done before. You have to start small and get into the big league at a later stage. The other thing, of course, we spoke about uh, for the indigenous uh, partners was that so far, 
or players are only in the, S, in the tier 1, tier 2, tier 3 level or, this, or the SMEs. We need to start moving up into the tier 1 level. But there is no shortcut to move up into the tier 1 level. Even HAL has got some limited presence, only limited. It is not full scale tier 1 uh, capability for HAL as well. And in my view, partnerships are the only way that you can move it because it's very capital intensive. Nobody has the, uh, should I say, the capital strength to do it all by itself, all by themselves. They have to make it into consortium. You have to get into those kind of arrangements. And I think the offsets that we are offering uh, in terms of all our projects, and IF has been the biggest, uh, should I say, uh, age, biggest service, which has because of its capital contracts because our capital contracts are large. We have generated something like close to $3 billion already uh, in terms of offset arrangements. We have signed something like 14 offset contracts in the last few years. And once MMRC comes, that is also going to further increase to about 20, 25,000 crores. So here's a great opportunity for our aviation industries to capitalize on that part. I also believe they have to be credible. They cannot be fly-by-night operators. They have to stay the long course. And they have to be our partners for the long term. So that in a nutshell is what I told you, but I wish you had attended that seminar. Some of your colleagues perhaps can fill you in with that. Uh, we take a question from the back, Mr. Vishal Tapar. Uh, since the Israelis are offering uh, air defense systems, uh, they have showcased the iron dome here. And uh, they are offering uh, cooperation in the larger area of missile defense. So considering that the DRDO has its own uh, missile defense programs uh, in the long run, is there room uh, for, uh, for systems like uh, uh, you know, the Iron Dome, David Sling, uh, and of course the Arrow? How does it marry in with uh, India's missile defense programs? Yeah, we've seen, seen the performance of the Iron Dome in the recent, uh, should I say, limited conflict in Gaza, which was last year. If I recall sometime in the middle of November, uh, when this took place, about six to seven days. And it proved very successful in their environment, because the catering for short-range uh, rockets and missiles being fired just across uh, the Israeli border. And the Iron Dome was successful to a very large extent. And it is still being in the process of being fine-tuned. Somehow I feel that in our context, we require our challenges are much bigger. Our areas are much bigger. Our airspace is far more dense. And our borders are far too long to have a very limited kind of a air defense protection system as what the Iron Dome offers. But certainly they are also uh, working a lot on the David Sling and on the, uh, on the Arrow system, which of course they have done in collaboration with the US. We have our own program. Uh, the DRDO is looking into some uh, collaboration and cooperation with them on certain aspects. I don't want to spell them out here. Uh, but we have our own program. And where assistance would be required from them on some of these areas, we would certainly take that. But like I said, certainly the Iron Dome is not the answer for our environment. Mr. Mishra. Sir, there's anything. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Mishra, Zee News. Sir, C-17 Romaster Production ka kya program hai? Why don't you take a comparison when I say take him? Is the performance as you have why don't you take him just to work with No master to satisfy comparison kya hai? दूसरा सवाल यह सर कि एयरफ्लाइट को दो एक्सरसाइजेस करने वाली बड़ी एक फरवरी में और एक शायद मार्च या फिर शुरू में इसका अगर कोई आपके लिए जैसे वो तो C17 जो हम इंडक्ट कर रहे हैं वो पहली बार इसका फर्स्ट एयरक्राफ्ट आ रहा है जून में इस साल इस साल जून में और इसके बाद दिसंबर तक मेरे ख्याल से � the contract we have signed for 2 years. And is it okay if I speak in English because we have a number of foreign correspondents here? Is it alright? No, but I have a lot of foreigners sitting here who should probably... It's okay, sir. 
Is that, is that okay? Can I speak in English? Sure, sir. Oh, I can do both if you wish. The C-70, like I said, the first aircraft arrived in June. Uh, before the end of the year, we'll have at least two, three aircraft more. And the induction will be over by 2014. The infrastructure is getting ready at our first base, which is at Hendon, which is also the base where we have the C 130J Special Ops aircraft. And it will actually change the dimension of our strategic area capability for the IAF. As you know, we operate from some very high altitude airfields, very unique in the world. And this, act, this aircraft actually is, is tailor made for that kind of environment. It can lift something like 77 tons of load, has a very large volume, and a lot of uh, the army equipment and air force equipment, which otherwise had to be broken down because of the existing platforms that do not have that kind of volume or the height and the span available. You could actually take it ab initio inside this aircraft. It also has an excellent short takeoff and short landing uh, capability, long range. So it will fulfill the, the entire need of the services. And uh, as not only that, for the nation itself, but it also has tremendous amount of capability for long range, disaster relief, and those kind of HADR uh, assistance missions, by uh, which you can see for yourself, Asia has been badly affected from time to time. So this is the kind of capability that will, that will give us uh, the induction of this aircraft. And the second second question was what? Regarding exercises. Sir. Uh, we have, like I said, the first exercise Iron Fist on 22nd of February. Uh, that's going to be held in the desert, uh, and we're going to be showcasing some of our some of our or just a part of our capability. Because the time will not permit us to go, you know, to stretch that exercise. So it starts sometime in the early hours of the evening, around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and it will go on up to night. And we will take you all there to have a look at that. Then, of course, we have in the month of March, April, we have a full fledged Air Force exercise called Live Wire. This exercise will be held in a number of phases. It integrates all the uh, capabilities that we have for different components in different scenarios. And we will exercise our, our operational commands and the other commands who will support the missions. And this exercise will be stretched over almost four weeks or so. We have a question from a foreign media friend in front. Andrew from Power Defense Review, Canada. So first question regarding fifth generation fighter cooperate with Russia. It seems you changed a little way of uh, development. Sorry? Uh, it seems you changed the way a little bit. Uh, you changed the way of uh, development uh, with Russia. So we've seen the new name. It's called PMF. Can you please kindly tell us uh, the procedure and uh, uh, the uh, timetable for this uh, project? And a second uh, question regarding Tejas that uh, you didn't uh, mention. This domestic domestic, domestic making uh, fighter. So we've seen this program delay and delay. What is your point of view for the future of Tejas? The last question regarding oh, China. Okay, let's take some time. Okay, thank you. Let, let me start with the first question. Actually, there's no change in our process for acquisition of any aircraft, whether it is the fifth generation or the fourth generation or the sixth generation. The process remains the same. Uh, this acquisition is going to, or it's, this development is a development program uh, with the Russian uh, side. And we have finished the, the DND phase, it was a very short phase, that has been over. We are now discussing the RD phase, which is actually the mother of all phases, the research and development phase. And in that phase, we would actually have three of these aircraft coming to us, starting from 2015 onwards, the first aircraft in 2017, 2018, and uh, these are all test development aircraft. And once we are very happy, satisfied with these, with the performance, and in that case, we will define what equipment will go into this aircraft. For all you know, it could be quite different from what the Russian Air Force, their aircraft will have. And the final production will start in India only by about 2022 or so, in which HL also are partners uh, in this uh, R&D effort. 
So right now we are negotiating so with the HL, with the Air Force and with the Russian side for this particular program. So that's the stages in which it's going to be built up. As you know, any new aircraft development is a long process. And the Russians had already started a little earlier. But our endeavor is that we should actually get the aircraft that we need and what we want. So that's as far as the FJF is concerned. As far as the, the Tejas is concerned, I, I agree with you, it's been a long process for uh, operationalizing this aircraft. But you know, when you design and build an aircraft for the first time on your own, uh, without any assistance from outside, uh, it's a long process. There are many things which you have to learn on your own. And uh, in between, when the design was taking place, uh, we had some sanctions on India, so we had to do everything in-house. But hopefully now that uh, we are reaching perhaps the end of the road because uh, we hope to get the IOC by, by the end of this year so that we can operationalize the aircraft by 2015, uh, that will be the first column. The aircraft is flying at the air display uh, for an envelope which we have cleared. It's a, it's a limited envelope. It's not the full envelope of the pages. But still you can see for yourself, it's, it's, it gives you a very attractive display. And hopefully by 2013 onwards, when the envelope starts to getting more and more uh, expanded, its performance will continue to improve. We also have this ex uh, aircraft taking part in the uh, armament exercise, which I just mentioned, in terms of firing weapons and missiles. So you'll see that there as well. Yeah. We take a question from behind the uh, gentleman in this court. Yes. Uh, can you just, can, who's, yeah, yeah. who's handling the air conditioning in this room? It's, it's too cold. <laughs> Is anybody else being cold or am I? <laughs> can, can you settle this? Somebody just, uh, I'm supposed to sit in the hot seat and I'm being cold. <laughs> Uh, yes. This is supplementing to the question that uh, the gentleman just asked. Uh, when we speak to ADA officials on the Tejas, my question is on the LCA Tejas. When we speak to ADA officials, they say that the Air Force keeps changing its requirements as far as uh, LCA is concerned. That's what they did in the case. Uh, the LCA uh, chairman who was here some time back said that the IOC is yet to come for their production. How much have these delays impacted your modernization plan? And, uh, how do you think that these can be overcome at least in part of your know, FGFA and other than other? Because again, similar headaches of you know, ADA being the IAF, IAF saying HAL, HAL saying again, you know, it keeps getting tossed around. Yeah, actually, we don't, we don't want to get into a debate on these issues here. All that I will say is that the QRs don't get changed, they're sacrosanct, they, they don't change unless something major something happens. The QRs effectively have not changed at all. But in the evolution of the aircraft, the designer also aspires to reach a certain point and he finds that if he's not able to reach that point, then we arrive at a certain point which is much lower or a little, little lower than what those figures are concerned. And there are, there are some very good reasons for that. And these are the kind of compromises one has to work around the system. Because you, you start with a certain intent in the design, you may not have actually achieved that intent in the design. And that is why all modern aircraft, or for that matter modern systems, you start with the Mark 1, you, you build a few of them, you learn all the technologies that go into it, you build the software which is all indigenous, and then you move on to Mark 2. And that those are the improvements that are taking place all the time, and not only in India, also, in the world as well. And that's also the reason why the LCA now, the IF said that we will take the LCA Mark 1 for limited quantity, and then after shift to Mark 2. Because you have to grow, continue to grow and improve from that stage. And it also gives the designers and people far, far more confidence. And that's the reason why we've gone into a second engine, a different engine for the Mark 2. We're also going to get an integrated EW suite for the Mark II. So all these improvements and changes are going to take place. And this is an evolutionary process. We have to go through that. Uh, but, over the, but during this process, 
we also have to improve the quality of our of our the way that you build aeroplanes. We have to have modern tools. We have to have modern infrastructure. Because those days of manually hitting the hammer on the metal is over. You have to have all these tools with you. You have to have all these quality control processes with you. And that is how the product and then the end comes out as a first rate product. And uh, hopefully, as we keep moving on to Mark 1, Mark 2, and maybe some Diane car is what we're looking at in the future. You'll find that you'll get some very state of the art aeroplanes coming out by the end of the century. And so, is Mark 1 a compromise that I is making, or Sorry? also can you elaborate on what you want in the Mark 2 as you told us? Is Mark 1 a compromise? I will not use the word compromise. What I'm saying is that when you have a certain design intent, if you don't achieve, achieve that design intent, you realize for yourself that that is the point that I'm going to achieve. Now I must move on to something something higher. And that is how you move on to a better class of aircraft from phase one, phase two, phase three. That's exactly how it, how aircraft industry develops and grows. So we are all different from anywhere else in the world. Mr. Rahul Bedi? Sir, uh, in light of what the minister said yesterday of appreciating budgets, and you said that capital acquisitions in the Air Force were of a very high uh, quantity, if we really do the sums over the next 20 years, uh, the Air Force capital acquisitions total to something around 70 or 80 billion dollars. Now, what does the Army and the Navy do as a consequence? Because uh, the expenditure that is going to be available to the Ministry of Defense is around anywhere between a 90 and 100 billion dollars. So that's my first question. The second question is, sir, you've been quoted in uh, a foreign publication as saying that the light utility helicopter, uh, the 197 acquisition, is uh, likely to be reassessed or probably scrapped. Uh, any There's a big difference between reassessed and being scrapped. Well, uh, the implication was that it was being uh, retendered. No, no, no. That's exactly what the Defense Minister clarified yesterday. The DAC, Defense Acquisition Council, has to look, examine that whole case. And a decision would then be taken on that particular case. So is that, does that mean that it's going to go into a retender or would this continue? Or is that what the DAC is going to decide? DAC will examine everything, the entire project. And my so, first question Yeah, coming to your budget part. See, see in, in the budget allocation for the chief services, and also for DRDO, out of 100%, on an average, you have an Air Force around about 26% of the, of the defense budget. Then you have the Navy, then you have the Army. The trick of the trade is, you have to keep the capital to revenue ratios in the 60 to 40 ratio. 60% capital, 40% of the revenue. The revenue is what you need to run your service. But if your revenue budget is so high, for whatever reason, maybe your manpower is very high, maybe you have too many vehicles, maybe you have you're burning up too much fuel, whatever reason. If the revenue budget is too high, then it then eats up into your capital budget. It eats up into your modernization. But you can't afford to not to pay pensions and uh, no, no, one, 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 one. Pays, pays and pensions are outside this. So therefore, they're a part of the revenue, but they but I mean we don't touch the pay and pension, they remain like so. So the issue here is, in a force structure which you balance out for each service, you have to then see for yourself how much should my revenue expenditure should be, how much should my capital should be. Because if my revenue budget is high and continues to grow, then your capital keeps getting squeezed and squeezed and your modernization is going to suffer. So that is the reason why you find that in certain cases, you have very little budget to modernize, and in certain cases, you have a fair amount of budget to modernize. As you also know, that the IF is actually all air forces. It's capital intensive. So is the Navy to a certain extent in terms of cost of warships. They're very high. So, so the trick of the trade is you have to be lean, you have to be mean, and you have to be thin. Because if you're too large there, then the budget that you actually going to get gets wasted away in just running a service and running the resources. To give you a small example from the Air Force point of view itself, 
this year, the cost of ATF has gone by, you know, what the dollar was when we started the year and what it ended up doing, there has been a big difference. The cost of ATF has gone up. So that eats into your empty budget. And this is the reality which we have to face. So the important part here is when we try and expand, we must try and expand in terms of a firepower, in terms of the assets that we have, we give ourselves far, far more effectiveness. We get a bigger bang for the buck and not the other way around. And when you see this distribution right down into the uh, 11th plan, the 12th plan, and the 13th plan, those ratios approximately remain the same. They don't change very much. But if you keep growing, growing, growing in terms of numbers, then actually what's going to happen is you're going to be spending more and more in terms of, as you rightly said, in paid pension, you're going to get, get in clothing, in food, lodging, transportation. These are all revenue activities. So the moral of the story is you have to be keeping your revenue side in a very tightly controlled budget. Gentlemen in the gray suit. No, 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 but if you, you should not look at just the, you have a total kitty here, and in that kitty, if 26% is what you look at, is what the ratios or the proportion that you get, then out of that 26%, what you're going to get is based again on your capital and revenue ratios. But if all your money is going into, if 56% is the what budget that you're going to get on the other side, out of which, let's say, 40% is going into revenue, you have such little bit available for your capital there. That is something which people have to work on. So, we have permission to take another few questions. Gentlemen in the grey suit. This is Rundanath Sanya from Blue Dash News. With uh, your fleet of four and a half generation and fifth generation aircraft that are going to come, and platforms like the C-17 and some natural advantages like some of the world's highest airfields, what would you say is the state of air power, air superiority in the context of the Indian region and China? No, we are going to have a very formidable case. In fact, the, the capability that you seek and what you need to build up to is that you, that you pose a very strong deterrent posture in the region. And it's not directed against China or this or that. It's for everybody. You need to have a strong, important air power capability in the country. Need to meet any of the threats, any of the challenges. And these will certainly give you a lot of punch and a lot of potency in the region that we are talking about. In the region, what is it like now? It is pretty good now. We will need, we need to improve it further. Gentlemen, sir. Chief Marshal Brown. For you. Mr. Brown, uh, uh, surprisingly so far that there have not been questions. Uh, oh, it's wrong, it's wrong. That's okay. Uh, regarding this uh, Rafal D, yesterday the defense minister was saying about the seventh mayor, seven steps and all. Could you for the country actually what timeline it is and then uh, what could be the problems? Maybe not in detail, but broadly, and then whether we see the deal inside at least next fiscal. Another question, sir, about me, uh, with respect to Tejas, is that I am reconciled that uh, it is not in 100% indigenous because the Indians, even for the Mark II, will be the American, the GE. Thank you. Now, the RF clarified yesterday to you on the, on the MRC project. The project is very much on track in terms of the CNC is concerned. It's an it's a extremely complex project to bring it all in together, but it's happening. We have finished a major part of the CNC. The, the other part that, uh, that is going on is, is, is the work share between HL, between DASO, uh, and, and all that. So all that is being put together now. And we hope that uh, in, by at least by April, May, I expect that the CNC should be over. And then it moves to the other stages of what we spoke about when it goes to the Ministry of Finance, 
when he gets re when he gets examined all over again. And uh, if all goes well, then before the middle of the year, so we should be in a position to sign a contract. And there are no shortcuts to this process, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Let me assure you that. Because somebody asked me the other question that uh, so and so is coming, uh, will it have happened before that? I said nothing doing. It has to follow the course. And it has to follow the entire uh, process. I know it's a time consuming process, uh, but, but that's how it is. And we started the CNC last year, uh, sometime I think in February. In January, February, we declared the one and we started the CNC that time in February onwards. So it's just about a year. In fact, there are some of the projects like Mirage Upgrade, for instance, it took us two and a half years of CNC itself. We hope that will not happen in this case. I'm very keen that we finish everything by the middle of this year. As far as Tejas is concerned, uh, we are very much involved in the uh, process of development along with uh, ARDA and the, and the HA. Uh, and I think as an indigenous project, we have to support it. There is no alternative. So whether it has an American engine or it has a Russian engine, uh, it doesn't matter. It's the integration that's all being done by, uh, by our people. At times, yes, we are critical. We have to be critical because this, after all, it's going to be flying uh, our boys uh, in the Scotland. So we have to get it right. But I'm very hopeful that the, that the LCA will uh, achieve those milestones as, as we just mentioned. Because nobody, uh, the, in, in terms of technologies, the most difficult technologies to master uh, is an engine uh, development uh, technology. And nobody gives that to you. I can, I can tell you that. You have to develop it yourself. And that is the reason why to, to, to make an engine indigenously is one of the most complex programs that one can ever take on. I think that's also the, one of the reasons why we haven't been able to make a fighter engine for so long. But it, should, it doesn't matter that we should stop. We should actually look into the areas and slowly and slowly start building up our, our expertise and technologies to get to that point. We take the second last question from the lady in uh, green suit. Thank you. Uh, uh, sir, yesterday, you, uh, the other day you were talking about... <coughs> is it me? Yes. Um, you were talking about uh, imposing penalties on la uh, late deliveries. Is that a concept or has that proposal been made? And uh, it would be good if you could uh, give us a sense of what kind of slippages have happened in which projects. There's no clarity on that so far. Is it 15? Actually, it's a good question because, you know, the, uh, the world over, you have programs where, where if you slip uh, and there are delays, there are very severe penalties. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that, those stringent penalties in our system, which needs to be introduced. And, and this is something which, as we get along in terms of reviewing our procurement policies, you know, the defense uh, initial the policy that is there. Yeah, I, know it. Uh, I personally feel that yeah. we need to increase those, those liabilities Clearance. to the suppliers and the customers because right now you just have the, uh, this year. something like, this is a very small amount, you know, performance, you know, this is something like 5%. In many other countries, that figure is fairly high. And that acts like a big deterrent to meeting strict timelines. Because many of these players outside, you know, he takes a loan and, and he's servicing that loan and because of that, timelines keep, keep sort of slipping. But the cost has to be made higher in terms of uh, penalties are concerned. This will also improve the, in terms of performance, in terms of timelines and everything else. There is certainly a very desirable thought. It's right now it's not so, it needs to be done. <laughs> so for the last question, you would like to uh, take on the next question? Don't worry, I have time, no problem. All right. Yeah, it's time. Uh, Mr. As long as, you, as long as you address me correctly, we'll take it on. Yes. Mr. Vishnu <laughs> Shah? Sir, uh, uh, you know, you've spoken about how... Yesterday you asked the question, I, yes, I, I, I owe you some answers for that. Uh, sir, yes, it's in fact related to the FGFA. I've already told you about the FGFA. Yes, sir, it's just a related question to what you mentioned a few moments back. You mentioned that you know we would have a very robust capability in the years going ahead. 
But the Chinese are also upgrading. They've got their uh, NKK platform, we've got our NKI platform. We believe ours may be superior, but there is an upgrade process happening on both sides. Similarly, they are developing their cell platforms. We've invested in a cell platform. Why do you believe, looking ahead, say 10 years, we would have a qualitative edge over here? I think you're a very smart answer. I think it's a big question. They will be the edge. Mr. Shivaru? No, sir, but a little bit more substantive than that. I'm sure that it will be the edge, but since this is such a platform centric issue, and you know, a big centric issue, I mean, how, how are you assessing their growth? Because it, it is quite extensive. See, unfortunately, you know, when we, uh, when we look at uh, apples and oranges, we get to just count numbers and compare levels and, and then arrive at certain conclusions. And what experience we have, uh, I'm, not, I'm not addressing this just to the Chinese side as you mentioned. I'm talking about across the board. It, when you do a bean count, it's not a question of 10 aircraft here and 10 aircraft this side. The heat needs of issues, how the training has been, has been gone through what operational experience those crews have had, uh, what backup support they've, they've got access to, their education levels. And these are the, should I say, the uh, intangibles which actually make a force very potent. And there I think we have a very, very good edge as compared to some of the leading air forces in the world. But the bottom line is, you have to start to have those platforms to begin with. And these are the intangibles which actually make all the difference. So, uh, when you say that, okay, they'll have a certain stealth technology, they'll have this, they'll have that, fair enough, I mean, that doesn't really matter. So, not only will be highly com comfortable, it will actually be far ahead. Chief, this is from Mike is off. Yeah, sure, tell me. Uh, Ajit, uh, Question related to some of the other questions that were here. How would you qualify your relationship, the Air Force's relationship at this time uh, with uh, HAL uh, in the light of uh, certain current programs as well as the fact that they're taking on some very serious programs uh, uh, you know, that will impinge upon the Air Force's future capabilities, considering that you are their principal customer. Uh, you know, most of what HAL exists for is for the Air Force. How would you qualify the relationship right now? And could you also specifically update us on the IJT and uh, the turbo trainer program? Because there have been reports recently that it's uh, that it's uh, it no longer exists or the Air Force is not happy with it and wants it shared. Yeah, our relationship in fact has been a good functional relationship. And you can see the word functional in a very broad sense. Because uh, the IF relies heavily on HL itself for not only you know, doing, doing the upgrades of our aircraft, all the other modifications that have, have to be done on our aircrafts, some of our overalls, they've all they're actually been done on various programs. I don't want to get into those, but and this, pro, and this relationship has been going right from the time that HL was formed and we need to say. And, and that's the way it has to go uh, in the future as well. We are all conscious of the fact that it's PSU as well. And now, when we look at the new programs, somebody asked me, uh, Raul Billy really asked about the budget part. Uh, see, we are looking at programs where we have to cut costs, we have to be very extremely selective in our budget making. In, in the, uh, we can't go into some vague experiments and, and so on and so forth. And therefore, it's not just the timelines, it's also the question of cost escalations in a program. So all these things are, are being looked at very, very minutely now by the RDA. It's not that we didn't look at it previously, of course we did. But now when you have a very uh, tight cloth to cut the coat in, you have to be extremely selective. And that brings me to the question of the, uh, the trainer that you mentioned. We have a Pilatus trainer now. It's a fully proven uh, trainer being flown by many of the countries around the world. And uh, the project which uh, HL is, is planning to, in fact, uh, make right from scratch 
perhaps our indication of the cost would, would even be higher. And then the IA would also will have to pay for the research and development. In, in our view, uh, there is no need for all this. We just need to stick with one trade-off. And that is what we have forwarded our recommendations to the government on that account. On the IGT, we have been disappointed in the lack of the progress that it has made uh, in the last few years. As you know, this project actually started in 2004-2005 and it's almost 8-9 years now. You heard the RM yesterday, the seriousness in which the MOD is looking at why this project has been stalled for so long. There are some engine issues there on the IGT as well because the Russian engine, uh, it has only been cleared up to 100 hours or so. The life is a new engine, so therefore the life of the engine has to be progressively increased by right up to 1200 1500 hours. Now, unless all these things happen, we cannot accept that as the imperial jet trainer. And these are the problems that the RM referred to yesterday. I'm just amplifying some of these issues so that for a, for a better understanding. So we are engaged with Techshare on all these uh, issues. Uh, they're also going to be our partners in the uh, MMRCA for the license production. They're upgrading some of our aircraft like the, the Jaguar, the Darien G program is on, some of our helicopter projects. So it is a, uh, it is a, functional relationship and, and naturally as customers uh, I think we have the right to ask for the best quality whether it's a private or a public sector. Thank you Mr. Narayan. Jump in the right side. So uh, you recently made a comment uh, saying uh, process uh, I'm here. Uh, you made a comment recently saying that uh, you build an aircraft, you could first choose the engine and then build the aircraft around it. Uh, so in light of FGFA, do you have an uh, engine in mind for the FGFA at this stage? Uh, secondly, could you elaborate on uh, the status of the space command that's been talked about? Okay. Now one of the first issues first issue about the FGFA, about the engine. Do you issue? have an engine in mind for the FGFA, for the uh, test flights? Ah, okay. The FGFA will have the Russian engine. Uh, you mean the NPO second? Uh, Currently it is flying with, an, uh, with I think, say 31 some mod, which is uh, for, gives about 1000 pages more than the existing engine on the Su-30. Okay, so that's the air port one. Yeah, but it, ultimately there would be a, better, uh, a higher performance engine as well. So right now during its development phase, it is going to be flying with this engine, which is actually a higher rating engine even than the one on the Su-30. But the aircraft eventually will even have a higher performance engine over there. As far as the uh, Space Command is concerned, you know, we had booted a proposal, uh, and I thought I'd just broadly explain this uh, a few months ago, where we required to get our expertise in terms of pure functionality for the three services for three commands. One was space, one was cyber, and the other was special operations. And based on the functionality, what we had decided to do was to give the domain expertise of a particular service in that command. So space was earmarked for the Air Force, Army for the special operations, and cyber was a truck. And all these commands incidentally would be all tri-service commands. But to be steered by one service where it had the domain expertise. So what we did was that we did a preliminary study, we got the views of all the services, since I'm chairman chief of staff, I can tell you about this. And we came up with this proposal, and now we've given, given a time of about six weeks, this happened in January, we've given them six weeks to come back to the COSC with the detailed proposals as the, each service has worked out. So by end of February, when we get back to Delhi, the Air Force will give their proposal and how they have worked out the full for the Space Command, the Army will for the Special Ops Command, and the Navy will give us from the Cyber Command. And then we'll move the, and if the proposal looks, uh, should I say, sound, and it's effective, then we'll then we'll thereafter move it to government. Can I just have a follow-up? Can I just have a follow-up, a small follow-up? Yeah. Um, we'll later. I so this one question is the stabilization class. Left. 
Shukta, uh, Ajay Shukta from Business Standard. Uh, just to follow up on the on the answer you've already given about work shares being ironed out between uh, uh, between the Reliance uh, Daso partnership on or on the one hand and between uh, Daso and HAL on the other. Is there a sense? I mean, we seem to get a sense that there is some degree of discomfort about giving uh, a work share or a significant work share to the H to the Reliance partnership, even though that would create an alternative to an already overburdened uh, Reliance, uh, to an already overburdened HA. Is there some uh, some sort of discomfort with part maybe because of uh, Reliance's record on say oil and gas supply, uh, the gas in the Krishna Gudavri Basin? I mean there have been there have been negative experiences in the past. Or would you actually welcome the arrival of another alternative uh, to HA? Well, discomfort from whose side? Uh, the government side. I, I don't think so. Let me explain to you, I think probably this, this understanding is not uh, come through clearly. See the MRCA uh, project, there is a direct supply of 18 aircraft and there is a nice production of 108 aircraft. Being, since the project is so large, the OEM has been given full right to select any production partners that he wishes to have in India or abroad. We have no issue with it. That means if he has to supply certain kits, he can, manu he can get it manufactured in Bangalore or he can get it manufactured in Timbuktu for all, for all that matters. Or with Reliance or anybody else. We have no issue with it or we have no, should I say, say in that matter. <coughs> that is business arrangement between Daso and Reliance, that's their issue. So it does not sort of uh, come into play at all when we come to license manufacture because as, as in the license manufacture part is very clear in the RFP that it has to be done by the HAP. Do you understand it? But even the license manufacture, the integration has to be done by HAL, Correct. but other components can be manufactured as well. Whatever else, whatever else he gets manufactured here, there, wherever, right? The Indian government or the IF has no issue with it. As long as those kits and everything else is supplied and given to HA and with assistance of uh, the OEM for the license manufacturing stage. So I thought I'd just correct this perception at all. And why Reliance? I mean, I think he has something like uh, 50 or so production agencies. Something, number of them. In India, uh, very much in India here. Also, I'm sure we'll have a number of these uh, partners with whom they've already, in fact, uh, sealed uh, contracts. And we don't even get into that part, because that is his, his issue. We are only looking at the direct supply one, the license manufacturing group. So, but that is a contractual obligation that uh, the OEM is supposed to carry. So, with your permission, you take the last question, sir? Yeah. Sir, sir. Sushil Sharma. Yeah. Sorry, I'm Sharma from Defence Monitor Magazine. I just wanted to know, sir, there have been reports that some of the Air Force platforms are being equipped with the uh, uh, sensor fused weapons, uh, what they call it, uh, cluster bombs. Whereas the cluster bombs have been already banned. So this uh, uh, system is coming again with some different nomenclature. Can you just elaborate why is the need for cluster bombs for the Indian Air Force and whether all the platforms of the Air Force fighters will be equipped with the sensor uh, fused weapons? Thank you. No, we have we have a program for certain sensor fused weapons which we are acquiring uh, from, from abroad, and uh, it's not that it's going to be uh, it, it's basically meant for meant against armor and other things, other other areas. Okay, support of the armed army. And we have no issue with that. And in fact, by March or April of this year, we will start having the systems here. All platforms are anti-personnel. Yeah, it's not an anti-personnel. It's not an anti-personnel. It's an anti-armor. Armor. The one that we are getting the anti-armor person. All platforms will be No, no. Specifically, we have one platform in mind. Mr. Mukesh? Sir, this is Mukesh Rashid from United University. Where are you? Uh, here. Oh, okay. Sir, uh, 
last week, uh, Emma Shoshomit Mukherjee uh, in an interview said that there is a ticklish and sensitive question which is coming in the way of uh, giving our women officers combat role in armed forces and uh, that is to be answered by political leadership. Is this that if uh, our officer is caught by the enemy, what, uh, what will happen? Uh, what is your take on this observation? And secondly, what you personally feel can they perform combat road? Well, no, I have no personal view on this issue. <laughs> you know, two, two, almost two and a half, three years ago, there was a conscious decision taken by the government based on the recommendation of the, uh, of the chiefs of staff that we will permit women in all other roles except for the combat road. And we are sticking to that position. Uh, that yes, they will be, they'll have full access to all the other roads except for combat roads. And we don't want to point to the reasons now and you know the logic and why this and why not that because we've gone through all this uh, in fair amount of detail. Whether it remains like this for the future, I don't know. Whether it will change, I really don't know. But uh, as of now, this is what the status is going to be. In. And I think I must tell you that the Air Force uh, in that context has the highest number of women officers. We prove they have full access to all the positions and, and, and posts. They are flying a transport aircraft, they are flying a helicopters. We are also starting to move them into the twin engine helicopters and twin engine aircraft as well, transport aircraft. <laughs> In fact, CNC training command is also here. You can tell me that we already have people pilots here in Bangalore uh, be, being trained on a on helicopter. Sir, okay, I have all the time. Don't get excited. Yeah. Well, your question was related to uh, what are the tactics and so on and so forth? And sir, are you pulling out from Chhattisgarh? Because there is a lot of bad perception now that are Okay, DGB, uh, Chattisgarh police gave a very scathing interview. Uh -huh. I see. And the MHA has also complained against you. Okay. I'll take a little while to explain this. Please bear me out. The IF is, is, is performing this role as, as mandate, mandated to us for the government based on the proposal and the request. Please note, based on the proposal and a request from the MHA a few years ago, three years ago, the IF is fully committed to perform this role and we are doing it to the best of our ability. So far in the last three years, you know the figures, we have flown over 6,000 odd sorties. Yesterday RM also mentioned that something like 172 rescue missions we have done. Not once have you read about this in the newspaper or in any media because we believe we are doing a job and doing it right. In this particular incident, if you were to look at the, the incident itself, then you can break it up into two parts. The first part was when this chopper got hit and the pilots did an extremely good professional job in putting her down. He suffered a hydraulic failure, there was an electrical generator failure. Inside the cabin, there was a fuel, fuel pipeline and hydraulic pipeline at burst. The cabin was filled, inside the passenger's cabin was filled with hydraulic fluid and fuel. The entire the fuel that was on the aircraft had spit into the, into the main cabin behind. As a matter of fact, the two Garut commandos got chemical skin burn injuries. Even today, if you see them, if you see the photographs, they have all these blisters and now they are in the process of recovery. Their eyes were filled with fuel. They couldn't even see. And this pilot has done a great job landing this helicopter about a kilometer away from where they were hit. It was evening time. <coughs> Thereafter, the sequence of events you know. We had this. Uh, this wireless operator who was hit uh, below, the, below the spine uh, on, his, on the left side and he could not be moved. Now in that, in that uh, zone, please understand it's a combat zone, 
the bullets are flying all over. Firing in fact was continuing for the next half an hour or 45 minutes or so. By, by, night, by this time it is dark and night. There is an issue, I must make it also clear. The captain and the crew decided, they took a decision at that point of time, that if they were to split up into groups, there is a live situation of a hostage, because the area is, is, was full of these people. You can imagine the situation if any one of them had been taken hostage, there would be another crisis unfolding in the next few weeks. And they decided to stick together as a team, get help quickly for the medical side as well as to get secure the helicopter which was lying in the field there. So that was the intent and this is exactly what they did. And it's because of that, three hours later, in fact, they reached that spot for two hours, it took the cobras about three hours to come and do the rest of the action. The police operator was evacuated at night itself in one of the armored cars and not on some motorcycle as something reported. He was taken to Jagdalpur, from there he was airlifted early in the morning by our, by our aircraft and taken to Raipur. He is recovering well, he is not critical as what is being reported in the media. <coughs> in fact, one of our officers went and met him last week. He was sitting on the sofa having a cup of tea. So this is how the situation was at that point of time. Now we can discuss it in, uh, in hindsight as we are sitting here now in a very cool and air-conditioned comfort as to what should have been done and what should not have been done. This happened, I think, I think it was the 19th evening, 19th of January. 18th evening for that, yes. Immediately we have taken a number of corrective actions so that we, don't, we do not have a similar kind of situation. I am not even talking about the sanitization of the airspace, I mean, the, the heli bags which are to be done by the uh, local police, uh, state police and so on and so forth. Now please remember that in operations like these, <coughs> we have to all work as a team. <coughs> and in that kind of situation, I was, uh, I was quite uh, surprised to, when we mentioned something about this. Uh, the letter that was written by, uh, by the Home Secretary. That at the time that the letter was written, we find that the letter is, is now with the media the very next day. How it arrived with media is somehow of, uh, of a big surprise to all of us. But nevertheless, what I would like to tell you is that our commitment remains the same. We're going to do the job. It's going to be a long haul. It's not going to find easy solutions. And if you keep uh, sniping like this, the same thing actually had happened in the valley. It's still happening in the valley, where they want to create division between the security forces and the security agencies. And if you're not careful, in the Mars region, exactly the same thing will start to happen, and they'll be very happy to have divisions within the security agencies. I do not think this is the way to function in, in a situation like this. And that is the reason why the RM himself said that after all the facts were known, that a big mountain out of a molehill is being, is being made. And I think the, the lesson that all of us have to draw is that all the agencies have to work together as a team and pull in the same direction, instead of trying to find faults on, on one incident and, and coming out. The helicopter is back to flying. It has gone for some repairs. Like I told you, the state of that uh, wireless operator is fine. He is going to take some time for rehabilitation. All those crews who were involved are back in operations in the same area, same zone. We are not going to change, we are not going to move, we will continue to operate. And that is how it is going to be. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll moderate. We'll have last two questions. Sir, that's a small yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, There are also, incidentally, there are also some report I read that some weapons were left behind. It's not true. In fact, because the helicopter impacting, one of the machine guns was jammed because the bracket was bent. And I wish, you know, these clarifications have been, been taken and we, we could have given all this. 
But the impression that has been conveyed is, you know, they walked away, they abandoned, they ran away. Uh, I think it's all nonsense. Uh, Chief, have uh, IAF, uh, Indian Air Force operator, sir, yeah. Yeah. Uh, on deputation to the NDRO, have they refused to uh, conduct UAV operations in the Naxal areas, hampering them? The reports about this happening, have they refused to function under Home Ministry instructions in UAV operations while they're on a deputation to the NDRO? Have there been any, uh, any performance issues or problems or working under them? Not at all. In fact, uh, the, why the NDRO has not been able to effectively uh, fly the UAVs is because they have very less people. Uh, they are facing a lot of shortages of uh, you know, mission operators and, and so on. So, so can I ask a question from Sujan? Yes, sir. Can I a question? You asked. Sir, there are questions for us that are different. See, I cannot, tell you, I cannot tell you what tactics, what changes we are doing. Please understand that. Because the Maoists will know that. Half an hour after we walk out of the room. Sir, is the ROE being so changed? Please, please appreciate that. Is the ROE being changed? What is being changed? The rules of the game and the laws are being changed. We are not changing any rules. And sir, you said this is not the way to function. For whom is it meant? Sorry? You said this is not the way to function. For whom is the suggestion? The suggestion is meant for everybody operating in their zone. That doesn't do the home secretary. No, no, no. We have to talk, we have to talk and, and move in one direction. Chief, That's uh, for everybody, including the IAF as well. Chief, uh, you know, I have been looking at the public record of uh, IAF helicopter operations in the in the areas of power influence. Uh, <coughs> according to one statistic, the IAF helicopters have been targeted about 14 times. They've been hit five times. Only once has it been grounded. But it gives an amazing strike rate to the Bowers of, of about 40-41%. Sanitization becomes a very big issue. Absolutely. You've been raising this issue since the last two years. Where do you stand? You know, the sanitization issue, as you rightly mentioned, if you were to actually go into that zone and see for yourself, the thick forest, I mean, it's, it's a dense forest there. To sanitize, you have to move on the ground. You cannot sanitize something from the air because you don't get to see. And that's the reason why uh, when we ask for sanitization uh, for a helipad, at least, at least it must be two to three kilometers around that helipad. Because that is the zone in which the helicopter is most vulnerable for takeoff and for landing. Because it's at low speed, it's at low height. And this is something which we impress upon all the time. And what happens is some of the standardized helipads or the main helipads, they are fairly well sanitized. But some of the ones which are in the interior, uh, you know, where the accessibility is not so good, those are the areas where uh, the danger is, is far. At this point, there is no, uh, should I say, uh, going back on this point that it has to be sanitized. Otherwise, we we'll keep getting hits like this. Sir, sir. Sir. Please, sir. That's it, sir. Thank sir, you very much. Sir, sir, sir. I'm not being given the chance. We can, we can have that later, sir, when we have tea. Sir, the larger, larger issue is, uh, again, it's not being touched for. Uh, is, uh, now, when we talk about this 300, 400 aircraft coming across in the 12th line, 13th line, sir, uh, what type of thing is the Air Force looking to get back to the squadron strength, doing the squadron strength? And that's a squadron strength, sir. Uh, so you have to have the 30, 40, 40, 40, 40, now. The second uh, is, uh, Yesterday also the Defence Minister mentioned about the geopolitical situation being very serious and serious in India, the US, without the door. And recently after the, you know, the border uh, where the two soldiers uh, that happened to say you also uh, talked about some kind of a, you know, serious stress if such incident happens. So what is your take on this, the geopolitical situation and the squadron strength? No, we need to build up to 40 combat squads. We need to build up to 40 combat squads by the end of the 13th line. Thank, Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you join us for tea, the follow, please.